Hello, everybody. Hi. Good evening. Um, I just received a... Well, I didn't receive it personally. I was recommended on the day of my birthday, August 8th, a video. One of the recommendations was a video on reparative therapy. Um, and, of course, I couldn't pass up. I felt that I was being egged on or provoked to respond um, to this. Um, so I want to make uh, my commentary reply and post it on that video for people to think about and see what they think about what I feel I have come to understand. Before I start, I want to ask you to visualize this metaphor. I want you to picture a 500-piece amazing orchestra with people playing different melodies and this amazing creation of a of a um, of a symphony being played, and all you can do is listen to the wonder of all these various instruments going off at different times, and one whole uh, harmony of 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 of, uh, of a musical experience that just leaves you in awe, and superimpose on that experience somebody needing to describe to somebody else what is happening, what they're listening to. And that person starts off by saying, well, now you, f you hear the clarinet. The clarinet is, uh, you know, hitting so many beats, and there goes the guitar, and that's the trombone. Hear the violins over there. And imagine this person trying to describe the experience of being... In, in the middle of that symphony and nonetheless trying to go through with it to the end and explain that that symphony, that musical piece that maybe lasts, imagine, a half hour. And so you have superimposed one person's experience of just closing their eyes and, and throwing themselves into that musical wonder of, a, of an experience. And then you have superimposed somebody's voice using language to describe that experience. The reason I made this metaphor is so that we can gain some humbleness and understand that that is akin to the limitations and the constraints of human intelligence, you know, the reasoning of how nature occurs or how society interacts, how biology occurs, how chemistry happens described through the human language. The uh, creation, creation is an immense, it's like the Big Bang, it's an immense thing, it's all of these things harmoniously happening at once, just like that amazing symphony. We could never really um, describe it in a way that you, like you would put it into a a disc, <laughs> um, what do you call it? Uh, oh, Jesus, I forgot the name. A CD card, whatever. Um, no, Jesus, um, I can't, I forgot the name of the little key, right? The little memory stick, a memory stick. And reproduce the movie just like it happened originally and genuinely when it was produced. Language cannot do that. All we can do is basically have a system of uh, a binary system of blips and spaces that attempts to describe what the human mind experiences. But language is very inept and very limited, very constrained in its capacity to convey the 
three-dimensional wonder of creation. And that means that we are also pretty helpless in explaining our... Now we can describe, for example, how our digestive system works. In the most basic, core, important aspects of its functioning. But we could never, in the same stream of speech, include all the things that are happening because of a digestive process, which affects even the heart, the bones, the all the organs, uh, how what's happening in the brain. All these things happen to the body through the in intake of a digestive process, and we could never explain the fullness of the digestive process in, in, in through human speech. We can explain and maybe put a lot of pauses and uh, jump onto another part of the body, but then we would have to put another pause and say, well, that is that depends if the liver produces quickly enough this chemical that will happen you know by the time we make so many pauses and tangents we're still like 10 minutes into the digestive process and we probably lost a person's attention uh, or or their capacity to to see the full symphony of chemical and biological processes that the body goes through uh, when it starts a, a digestive process so uh, this is, it's important to understand our own limitations and really be very humble before the, um, the vast, <laughs> the overwhelming, almost insurmountable limitations of human intelligence when it comes to our audacity in, for example, uh, judging and subjecting people's um, lives to our understanding or analysis of, for example, their sexuality. And we start right away coming up with um, moralistic and uh, chastising or um, uh, judgmental views and perspective on, on whether this, believing this is right or believing this is wrong. And we forget that really we're very, very inept in explaining life, uh, creation, biology, uh, social complexity between human beings and all of all of things that happen as one expression of life, one whole entire expression of life on this planet, perfectly harmoniously going forward with our little beam of... <laughs> of very narrow perspective, <laughs> our very narrow beam of light, which is our language, only able to look at one thing at a time. Um, so it is important that we embrace, first, before we even get started, that we're probably wrong along the way all the time. <laughs> the wisest thing that humanity could do is to seize this reality, that we uh, need help, we need to... Uh, collaborate and we need to believe others and what they may have discovered or seen that we are missing we must understand that we're prone to fallacy instability error our intelligence is very challenged before what we are proposing ourselves uh, which is to understand our existence the the, the existence of life <laughs> of, of evolution of creation uh, and how everything works uh, we're probably um, right in, in one little narrow aspect about a lot of things, but in the vast majority, we're probably wrong about everything. If you want to understand how much we're missing and how much we're omitting and how much we haven't, we didn't factor in, uh, you would have to conclude that we're, in the overall sense, wrong about the majority, even though we're maybe uh, uh, maybe right about. Uh, one a line of of analysis in this in this vast area of understanding. Um, this said, you know, when you're going to start talking about homosexuality and sexuality, 
the first thing that we should probably um, acknowledge is that our sexuality and homosexuality is really within human sexuality. It's not something that has been classified in a different category as a civil condition or situation uh, to human civilization. It is something that happens to human sexuality. Um, think of the, 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 the purpose of human sexuality right away. It is to mix our genes, right? Mix our genes and our DNA and and um, draw from all of these different conditions and circumstances that affected the lives of millions of people to keep producing and evolving the next generation, which means that by nature, it is about everybody. It is about social. We are, um, you know, if you compare it to hunting, for example, or procuring food, it's a special, it's something that has to do more with specialization and a little bit of sharing, but basically we pass on things that we learn from father to son and we develop systems that we teach others in society. It's much more uh, of, a, um, of a specialized uh, sort of focused um, aspect of human civilization. When it comes to sexuality, it does not want any rules. In fact, sexuality, there's a part of sexuality, which is it's, you know, I, I, I separate uh, or rather, rather um, uh, identify three basic areas in homosexuality, also in sexuality, but in homosexuality, they stand out a little more defined and they are biological and chemical which are all the forces and neurological reactions and things that have to do with chemistry and biology that really are not so concerned with what gender it is that is causing you to put all your juices into motion and become stimulated and have all the functions start you know um, acting up <laughs> Uh, then there is social and cultural, which is how we learn about this in us, uh, regarding ourselves and regarding others through society and culture. In other words, um, and this is important because sexuality is really all about everyone else outside of the family we're leaving the family, we're going off to find people that are far away to mix with their genes and their DNA. So what people are saying, what they're teaching uh, is very important to, as, as this, this part of sexual, cultural and social um, education through society, through what people say. And typically that's, for example, we see it in children that Yes, you, you know, uh, parents maybe try to educate their children sexually, what have you, uh, in their in their um, de demeanor and their behavior towards the opposite sex, for example. But typically, what we see is that the kid um, goes and and looks for it outside and hides the magazines that he shares with his friends, and and they have experiences that they don't tell their parents about. Um, and so, oh, my battery is running low. Great. And then the third, the third aspect is um, sociological and psychology. So, which has to do with our inner self-perception and attitude, our how we act behaviorally um, and what our impulses, how we interpret signals, um, the whole psychological aspect of, of sex. Oh, great. Is this working out? Yeah. Um, so that's, that's, oh, oh. Jesus, I'm sorry. I'm pressing things because I'm recording with my cell phone because it's so much better quality than 
Okay, there we go. Um, and so there are these three areas. When it comes to homosexuality, the psych psychology takes on a very important role, and um, and it does have to do with developmental and formative. Okay, so wait, let me let me get let me get my my thoughts well ordered. Basically, um, in America, America, our culture has created a, a, a panorama on homosexuality, which is I'm not even I'm not even saying how wrong it is yet. <laughs> I'm first bringing you back to remember the limitations of human intelligence, our analysis, our explanation of how nature works. And so keeping that in mind, given the metaphor I, I, I gave you before, our rundown on how we explain homosexuality in today's modern society, and it has been America that has led the West's uh, ideas and, and how we are to view homosexuality and all this. Remember, it is it is just one take, one drill of 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 uh, explanations and uh, explanations of values and solutions and proposals to situations and based on how we believe things. Um. And what I typically see, like looking at this video that I started watching, um, is that the belief in America is that reparative therapy attempts to uh, heal and change a person's sexual orientation. That's how, quote unquote, it was put to, uh, you know, change. Uh, and, and if you think about what that means and what that presupposes, it is automatically, in order for that to make any sense, in order for reparative therapy to be explained as something that would change a person's orientation, you have to establish that orientation is given before birth, otherwise that sentence wouldn't make sense. If you understood sexuality as something fluid that can go one way and can go maybe start going the other way and maybe broaden or narrow and, you know, something organic and fluid, you couldn't say that it is about changing something from A to B or B to A. Um, so, one of the problems, I don't, I'm not even sure how to, how, to, how to continue this, but basically, what we're doing wrong, um, maybe I should just cut to the chase as far as the, the most egregious and humanly the most disrespectful and undemocratic, imposing, authoritarian, um, autocrat, uh, uh, um, how can I say this, um, limiting, uh, boxing in acts aspect of our, solu of our formula, our solution as a culture to homosexuality is that we're not letting people uh, see if there's a way it can no longer be that way, <laughs> you know, and we're not validating those people that say, yeah, I admit that I am attracted to the same sex, but I also feel that I have the right to see if there's a way that I can uh, no longer feel that. That is about freedom. Now, we don't allow it because we're defining that as a person that doesn't want to accept how they were born, 
And so we're chastising that freedom because of a definition about homosexuality that we've established. What if the science of homosexuality and sexuality is totally different and much more, a, a little more complex and a lot broader and a lot more changing depending on how far down or how, 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 how far into life you have continued maturing or how old you are in other words or how many experiences you've had or what types of experiences and what your mind is like. Could all of these things uh, could play an immense role on whether you will satisfactory, really earn it, genuinely be fulfilled and satisfied for having, for leaving homosexuality. And maybe uh, other cases would be, could never really say, um, I stopped liking the same sex. And these two cases, should they not be part of the whole, both accepted? Why do we have to explain um, sexuality as something that needs to happen this way and then that way? And if not, it means that you're wrong. It, we're really uh, being very um, um, closed-minded and oppressive on on people's honesty, on their sincerity. Now, one of the um, one of the things that we're saying in our in our version of interpreting homosexuality in our society is that. Um, and, and we're also people who want to leave homosexuality and want to are also convinced they're also inside a format that has them want to no longer do something so that they can be the alternative that, you know, uh, it's also very binary. And f they also, you know, you have the sort of uh, anti-reparative therapy people that say, um, your their accuse accuse people who are not accepting of their homosexuality as indoctrinated by religion um and that it is religion's fault it is religion that doesn't like homosexuality it is religion's fault that um that homosexuality has always been repressed um and therefore the alternative has also become part of the um, the way out for people that stick to their guns about wanting to leave homosexuality and they find solace and harbor and protection among religious groups and they find that faith um, and um, sort of shores them shores them up around a, a community and a group that um, keeps them safe and, and on track. And, you know, I just don't feel that we are understanding the science of sexuality as a society, as a culture, as a civilization. I think that it is much more complex. There are things that we're afraid to talk about a certain way because they sound, they have connotations that would suggest different things that we're not to say or not to believe. Um, we're very... Um, we've got a lot of problems <laughs> with sexuality. And there's a lot of hysteria. There's people that want to shout things about, um, you know, whether it's because there's a hysteria of keeping things secret or a hysteria about making them loud in society. It's... I think that we're uh, really constraining ourselves to the point of creating problems. Now, let's go back to separating homosexuality into three areas. If, um, indeed, you know, this is a, another funny part. Um, when it comes to the animal kingdom, we have no problem in identifying that uh, social conditions maybe environmental conditions, ways in which the parents raised or didn't raise uh, their offspring resulted in either uh, 
certain so many chicks coming out a certain way or gay or the eggshells being you know weak and brittle and so we have no problem in understanding scientifically how uh, vulnerable sexuality the sexual elements of our offspring and their, our development our sexual maturing everything is very subject to is very much subject to conditions and circumstances in that in the collective of that species but when it comes to us, we are really uh, resistant to, you know, tying the links to uh, how we're treating ourselves as people in a everyday society, civilization, the way we go about everything, work, education, family relationships, moral codes and ethics and what have you, how all of this is resulting in more or less homosexual desire or children feeling confident about their sexuality or being a little sort of ambiguous and not sure what they ought to do and anything that has to do with their the development of sexuality does not get linked to how we are treating ourselves as a species in our civilization i think this is really interesting it's like blatant denial we we don't want to admit that sexuality and homosexuality are directly connected and linked to how we're treating each other as people, <laughs> um, as friends, as family members, as as employers, as educators, or as governors, government and the way government exercises its relationship of fear and authority to in, 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 the, in the communications capacity, how much we're able to be ourselves and express uh, some degree of power within government and so many things are um, about our civilization and how we treat each other as people and we don't want to connect this to the uh, the growth of homosexual desire or the ins or the number of incidents or in instant incidents of homosexual preference um, you know, I just feel it's very interesting, and we're um, really, really enclosed in in certain prescriptions uh, that allow us to believe it must be this way or that way. And and uh, you know, what I feel is that um, being that sexuality has everything to do with our social relations and so how you know our first sexual experiences remember the classical story of the 50s of how your buddies took you to the the whorehouse and you had your first experience with a prostitute and what have you this is very uh, it seems like a kind of um a fate you know a story uh, a hollywood story but in reality it's very typical uh, of, of, of our first sexual experiences that they happen through our peers and through the, the parts of society outside of the family and maybe even far away when we travel we have our first sexual encounter in another country um, and so if so much of society and our relationships with our peers and how we, uh, you know, because it all, it's all a buildup. Uh, the little boy will have a self-perception that has a lot to do with how his father taught him to self-perceive himself as a male. Uh, and it's not necessarily very simple that the child might learn from looking at how the father treats himself as a male and then how him and his friends treat him, in other words, the father and the father's friends treat the little boy in the in the sense of male collective rapport. Does he get included into the clan of males, or is he tr is he put in a in a separate thing and they do things secretly and not include the little boy into the group of friends of the father? You know, there's a lot of things that play into how that boy is developing his sense of his own sense of masculinity, which later segue to how he will relate to his male peers. I'm not inventing this. This is all science. It's already laid out there for us to refer to. But for some reason, we 
don't want to associate this to to sexuality. It's really fascinating how we have become bent on making it a civil a, a civil value, something that has to do with civil rights and freedom of expression and a bunch of other idealisms. Uh, you know, that started because of what happened, Christopher Street Stonewall. You know, we we just said we're not going to think about this anymore. We don't want to. It's too tiring, too exhausting, too much accountability, perhaps, too much that we have to face in, in the sense of responsibility about what we're doing to our children. It's just easier to assume that you're either born that way or you're not. And, you know, if you and you help us by declaring yourself, right, help us help our laziness by declaring yourself one or the other. And then we'll make sure that you have equal rights and you can get married and you can adopt. And you can, you know, this, this is something nature wanted and <laughs> nature did not want it, but we it's easier for us. <laughs> you know, anyways. Um, so and, you know, that means that if, you know, it's not that you can, um, it, I, I see it more like something that um, matures as the child is growing up and going into adolescence, his sexuality. And um, our sexuality is very much driven by how good we feel about that sexuality. So uh, it wouldn't be the first time that a guy that thought he was gay all of a sudden had sex with a girl that made him feel great. And he made him feel like he was the man and and she was just sweet and he she wasn't anything of the things he hated about his mother. And that quote unquote gay boy stayed with that girl. So it's really about how, you know, it we decided that there's a, a switch that gets flicked one way or the other, but that is not sexuality at all. Um, and in any case, what I have experienced is that if you start opening up that side of you or you start becoming open to that side of you that it would enjoy yourself with a girl in your life and you have been gay before that, it becomes easier to really see the contrast and understand without reparative therapy that you like yourself psychologically better how you are with that girl. Then what now becomes more obvious were your needs to be loved and included or appreciated and uh, or, you know, there's psychological, there may be um, one aspect that I've always identified to homosexuality is laziness. It's almost like you want a man to do the hardcore stuff that uh, about facing the world that you can just uh, substitute by taking refuge in a relationship with a guy. But it's not always like that. But, you know, it's a way of escaping a band-aid of, of sorts also to whatever problems of self-perception you may have. Um, psychology is very much part of homosexuality, but unfortunately, the big mistake psychology made is thinking that it's a condition that revolves around the individual and is not entirely nurtured by our relationships to society. And would our mind already be able to just flew, flow the other way, <laughs> flow back to our natural sexuality, it might not be all that hard if there is a, a general sense of acceptance by everybody in society that a guy may have been gay and now he's finding out that he didn't really want to. Society would be accepting and generally knowledgeable about what could have happened early on in that person's life to where they naturally, guys would naturally give a little extra inclusion, a little extra help uh, in in feeling, in that, in, in forgiving, you know, because really it's about that, you know, there's a, a, a side about guys that they kind of um, resent that you betrayed yourself uh, sexually, and so they have to forgive you. Um, but anyway, these are things that are not talked about because it's not the realm in which we have placed 
homosexuality uh, in recent times. Um, but yeah, I don't know how much further I can take it than this. I'm, I'm, I'm not really closing it with any concrete. <sighs> Mainly this is an exercise of, of, uh, of warming up the brain to realize that our, you know, that we have confined ourselves to f formulas and rules of understanding about homosexuality. And really, homosexuality is something organic. It is about human sexuality. It is something that develops. It, it, it you know, and if you had to define it, technically, it is basically experiencing sexuality with the same gender. It really isn't much more complicated than that. And within that definition, there are, you could find sub-definitions, which are a person that for whatever reason is kind of like behind or needs to catch up or has a void or, or, or has a fears or what have you that needs to find and uh, finds a sort of a healing or finds shelter or finds love and acceptance or recognition or what whatever the analysis may be in the same gender but then also as part of this definition is guys that don't see anything wrong with it and so it's not just one thing or the other and it's not just whether you are prone or born from that singular extreme one side of the polar equation or not or, or not gay or not at all predisposed or inclined um, you could have maybe started off never really finding any satisfaction totally normal always had girlfriends and therefore by all definitions nobody would could call you gay until you've maybe started having experiences and lost any kind of trepidation also because of society and culture's help uh, that you're not to chastise you're not to say anything wrong against homosexuality and so all of a sudden a few years later a guy had enough experiences with guys and still likes having sex with women that he sees two different types of experiences and he's lost all fear towards homosexuality or natural fear that would be um, because there is a part that is homophobia is comes from a part in our brain that is uh, we push it to do something in which our our overall design is not geared or not aligned to go towards and so there's this discomfort instability stimulates suspicion uh, there's the sources of regret or shame or fear that are not taught by religion. They, they stem from wanting to f make the body do something that it does is not how it's designed. It's not necessarily that it's designed against it. It's more like there's nothing laid out for it to be that way. So naturally, a lot of in state instability, um, regrets or misgivings or what have you happen, and naturally that there is a biological homophobia. It's not a terrible, chastising, mean, and evil thing. Uh, we've turned it into that. We called it a civil category. But in any case, with homosexuality come the other two areas so when, when i'm describing a person that lost his fear or trepidation about homosexuality and now is just as easily able to enjoy sexuality with a guy until he's had enough and then he goes back to women for a while and maybe doesn't it really depends on who you know invites him to have sex that he will or will not try it again um has to do with the biological and chemical part of the third that I said, the third space. Um, the sociological and cultural in this case has always allowed him 
uh, I'm sorry, this, this, the uh, social and cultural. The social and cultural has always allowed him because it's, you know, hey, it's all about the 80s and, and being coming out and da-da-da. So that was never a problem as long as he didn't go live in Iran or anything, right? Um, and then the psychological part is interesting because this guy already started with a, a, a well-rounded masculine formation that found his interest in how women made his masculinity feel and so there wasn't a predisposition for there wasn't his dad was treated him like a, a father raising a son and the mother was totally gentle and treated him like a mother raising her son and so there wasn't a, a curiosity a need or a, a propensity to pay attention to guys that would you could say there was a little bit of a psychological setup in this case there wasn't um and so when he discovered that he wasn't a, he could just maybe why not have sex with guys and didn't have any kind of hangups about it, um, his psychological aspect maybe, maybe is sort of what gave him a sense of oh that's enough betraying myself. That's there's a part of natural phobia that was healthy towards uh, natural phobia towards homosexuality it was healthy in that guy that grew up normally uh, as a guy and that later lost his fear towards homosexuality that is kind of also helping him you know it's like eating too much ice cream after a while you don't want anymore um, all of these aspects and ways of understanding are completely ignored we we have created a very very narrow very um hysterically precise in reasons and meaning and significance uh narrative on homosexuality that is completely <laughs> um looking the other way from what a broad science as far as uh, human, the, the very broad human uh, developmental biology and chemistry is regarding sexuality and how homosexuality can occur to the species for in so many different ways. Whether it is because of innocent willfulness, so I'm going to try it and see what it's like, or whether it's somebody who really feels there's something that they need to seek that gets... Uh, nurtured when he when he, he feels love with the same or she feels love with the same gender um these nuances and these different cases are completely it's, a, it's almost like a whole universe that is not explored that we decided to just you know put down a a, a, a uh, um a, a very simplistic roadmap on how to interpret human sexuality and it's really not fair and it's very destructive and it's very authoritatively oppressive on a lot of people who are more open-minded who are more fluid who say hey i'm being honest <laughs> i uh, yeah i did all this stuff and i i understand now why i was doing it i really don't want that anymore where is there the knowledge? Where are where is there the support? Where are there the people that believe me that say, okay, you know, we're here. Uh, maybe you should meet a girl like this or try a girl like that. You know, is more what would be good for you in this phase of your life. Or we have nothing to say to these people. We have obliterated any kind of fluidity in in homosexuality and have prescribed these these niches it's terrible it's terrible and so i i don't really and you know um even when i try to have this conversation with people who believe in in changing quote unquote and leaving homosexuality and finding either reparative therapy or congregation i find it very hard to to find like-minded, comfortable analysis, perspective, acceptance. I find it very hard to, um, um, people have their reasons that they must adhere to in order to save them from, from this past they want to push 
uh, ener energetically from, um, you know, so I'm not saying it's, <laughs> it's, I'm, it's sort of like being, when you open your mind to the wonder of creation and the, the vast complexity of this symphony that is uh, the biological reality of creation and, and species on this world, you find yourself that in between a rock and a hard place of people that feel they must explain life this way or that way. <laughs> and you can't talk to, you don't have anybody to talk to. <laughs> that's the irony. <laughs> So anyways, okay, so that's my contribution to um to this video. Thanks. Bye.